So uh, welcome you all to this evening. Uh, so myself, Giri, I work as a lead scientist at Signature Discovery, a bit different from what you guys are doing. Uh, we work on uh, designing new drug molecules, basically medicines for certain human diseases. And we are uh, quite a few number of um, scientists working towards this particular uh, objective. So I'm, why I'm being invited, and <laughs> basically I'm using nine for the past many years, since 2007, uh, during my academia, I've been started using it, and NIME has been uh, grown and developed into much more what we see back in 2007. So a lot more nodes, a lot more capabilities, a lot more data handling capacity, all being improved a lot. So just to give you an idea about today, what we are going to speak is to just to give you an overview of NIME and what's new in 5.0 because in 5.0, it's completely changed its UI, as well as a lot of implementations of uh, the extension labs, basically integrating AI as well as ML. So don't be worried about too much hearing about, oh, AI, I need, I need to know too much of coding and scripting. That's why we are here, because nine does not need any coding. So it's basically called no coding or less coding. You can still do coding if you really wanted to, but without coding also, you can do that. And a few nine extensions, which might be interesting to you, which we will be doing after my presentation, we will be doing a hands-on session about a chatbot. We'll be prepared, creating ourselves and a quick demo on a use case and Q&A. Just to quickly give you about what we do as in Signature. So it's a CRO company. It's being founded in 2004. Uh, our head office is at Nottingham site. And we have multiple sites at Canada, US, as well as in UK. And the best part is that we have more than uh, 40 preclinical compounds and 22 clinical compounds. That's where we are trying to do research to find out solutions for different diseases and all whatever we are trying to repair your mechanisms that we are trying to do. So we are 33 members in the computer science and informatics, which includes uh, computational chemistry, chem informatics, and two of my colleagues are here uh, from Chem Informatics team, who is also working to Nine Hub and Business Hub. And we have more than 400 chemists and more than 200 client projects being worked on. So I'm really excited and uh, thanks to Nine for inviting me to this. Why we choose Nine at drug discovery or computational chemistry is something very, very important because it's primarily its applications in computer aided drug discovery and due to speed, data volume, breadth of functionality, and state-of-the-art data wrangling and data science features. It's really good because we handle a lot of data. So we need some platform which is very stable in handling a lot of data, and we want to do data wrangling, data cleaning, data management, as well as properly get into analysis. So our analysis is slightly different than what you analyze from an Excel sheet. So that's the main reason why we depend, and it's a daily driver for us uh, when throughout our projects for most of us, most of us in the company. So now let's get into our business of today. That's to overview of nine. So as I said, it's a tool to make sense to your data, how you can make your data simpler and make it understanding by visualizing it, deploy it, or you want to manage how you want to look at it or how you want to organize them quickly, easily, and then much simpler way. That's why, as I said, you need not to know Python to do this. Generally, we use pandas, scikit learning, all these for modeling. If I do not know any scripting, what do I do? Yeah, you have nine or similar platforms like this. So you can do data analysis, data science, data engineering, transformation, visualization, reporting, and integration. So any, any of, from the audience from computer science background, or from online, oh yeah, you are here. So this is something very important about integration. If you want to pull data from your cloud, let it be Azure or SharePoint or wherever you want, and then you wanted to do analysis or you might want to change how it looks like, some aggregation, pivoting or something to be done or group by, and then you have to upload back to maybe push to your SQL table or SQL DB or pull it from there and push it back to Power BI in order to visualize that. Right? So if you're doing it manually, you have to do it from one software to download it, export it. Or if you're doing it by Python, you need to have all APIs to 
built in together. But here, it's just a drag and drop. You have specific nodes for that to take care of it. Of course, you, have, you should have respective licenses for respective databases and your cloud management system. So it's open source again. It can be used by anybody. It can be used for any purpose. But uh, to be uh, very clear, some of the extensions that you're going to use, if it is licensed or commercial, you need to have the license for those. But otherwise, Nine itself is more of an open source uh, on, on what the platform you're working, because you can also create your own nodes. You can work on your own workflows. There's a community hub available for that, where Paulo will be giving much more information about it. So it is a visual design paradigm of data workflow. The data can be anything. It can be, I don't know whether we still started with working with images, but we work with chemical structures, numerical data, classified data, or any alphanumerical data. It could be anything. And finally, no coding is required. That, that's the best part here. So to just give you some of the parts or how the nine looks like, where it starts, like when we talk about uh, uh, Python, we talk about some syntaxes, some packages, the same way we have some nodes here. So it is, this is basically, let me, let me pull up the laser point, sorry. Yeah. So if you see here, this is, this is something called as a node, that, that's the engine. So here it is called as CSV reader, that means it can read a CSV file. Not only a CSV file can be multiple CSV files or multiple CSV files from a single folder and think it is possible. And you can manipulate the data. You can limit how many rows to be read or how many columns to be read. All can be restricted and manipulated within that node. But node has different uh, features or parts. Whatever that is going in here, that is called as input. So from somewhere output, you're trying to give the end the data, input the data to that node. So if I want a column filter, I need to have some Excel sheet or CSV data or TSV tab separated values, TSV data or any data. And there I need to filter some columns. There might be 100 columns. I need only two columns that should go out from that particular node. So that is my output node here. I mean, output window that is going here. But then we have something called traffic lights, the red, yellow or orange, and then to green. So what are these traffic lights? If a node shows you with the red color, it says it is not yet configured. You have to configure them what parameters it's required. You have to set whatever things that you have to manipulate or process the data to get the output. And when it is get it to orange or yellow color, we say it is configured. It is ready to go, but you have not yet executed it. And when you click on, and when it's being executed or when you run it, basically to run it, you have to click on this button, the play button. So when it runs it, then you get the green light, the traffic. So that means it's executed, ready to view the data or the output. But then sometimes things happen. It doesn't work the way we want it. There will be a into mark with red color that sends the error. So you have to mouse over on that particular red color. It tells you what is the error. So you, you will be able to troubleshoot your workflows and uh, nodes much more better than Python, what you're trying to do, because sometimes it's not related to it. When the combination of these work uh, nodes being connected, as you see, there are connections through some lines here at the bottom, and they are called as workflows. Multiple nodes can be combined to form a component, a meta node, all these are possible, which, which is a bit advanced, I'm not going there. So if you have a larger workflow with 8,000 nodes, you, need not, you don't want to see that 8,000 nodes to be there. So if you can cluster these nodes together to a meta node and say, okay, this is doing this function. But when you get into the meta node, it will, it will be with another 1,000 nodes. So you can cluster them and keep it as, to look at simpler and nicer for a person who did not generate the workflow. So this is what we do with workflows and uh, the nodes. To look into data science lifecycle quickly, it's always to create it, then the production process and go with the production. So we need to have to create the data or we already have the data, but we have to train the data in order to be processed for any uh, production run. So any data, however it is in whichever format, we cannot directly get into it. There is something happening in between to prepare that data to be ready for production. So for that model cycle, we, it, is, it is a iterative process, right? So multiple data coming from multiple sources at different timing, we have to schedule them, how this to be processed to go for modeling or getting into your AI model 
or getting into production. So you need to know where and which and when to be done. So let's think that you have a data coming in and you have to blend and transform that data and that goes to model and visualize. So modeling and visual, modeling itself is an iterative process. You have to optimize the model to get a better predictive uh, capability. And then you optimize and then capture them. So it is a cyclic process. The same way when you're going for production also. But then, yeah. So this all can be done locally with the nine analytics platform, which you would have already downloaded on your laptop. So this does not require any internet while you're working on them until unless you're pulling some data from internet or from databases or you're installing some extensions. The same way, that's what we call it as prepare and build. But then coming to the production, you can start with validating and deploying them. So we, we can do it in nine hub or nine uh, business hub where you can deploy it as versioning, which I'll show in a moment. And then you can consume and interact so that a person who does not have not installed the nine in their laptop still can use nine hub over the browser so you don't require the actual nine software installed so this might be the end user the person who developed is the developer who was working on with workflows and optimizing them and then you can monitor and update it really as well so that is what you see as a web app or which is called as a data app which is again on the cloud this cloud can be locally mounted or it can be on AWS or maybe on nine servers itself. So this is completely works on your web browser, right? So these are both two different uh, platforms that you see. One is the nine uh, local installation, which is the analytics platform. The other one is the nine hub, which can be uh, incorporated in your inter intranet or from nine server, which is a cloud access. So let's see what Nine does in the Nine Analytics platform, which we are which we are going to do some hands-on experiences today after this session. So we can access and blend. Basically, you can read the Excel files from using something called Excel Reader or CSV Reader or again Snowflake Connector. So Snowflake is something similar to AWS. So you can have connectors. I hope the computer science guys will be knowing much more about Snowflakes and AWS and others too. And then you can have a DB query reader. So all these can be read into it as an input. So you can see the common pattern here is the orange color nodes generally go for pulling in data or reading in the data. And then you have an yellow colored node which says concatenate. You can join all of them, right? As you, as you, as you try to join different data sources. So I'm joining Excel file, CSV file, and the data from Snowflake or AWS or wherever you want, or an SQL data. But I'm just using a single node to concatenate it. And I can define which should match, which column should match, if how the duplicates to be managed, everything can be set within the particular node. And then I want to transform that data. The transforming the data contains, like I want to rename some columns. I wanted to also basically partition them based upon the data that came out or pulled in. And then I want to do some decision learning, some like ML modeling, uh, and see how the data is coming along and end sampling to compare, and then also then go for the next level to visualization and explore. So this is after just analyzing and modeling them. But you can see the data sources from three different sources, entirely different sources. If you're doing this manually, you might be probably doing sitting and converting each of these files, maybe to Excel or CSV or whatever platform dependent proprietary formats. But here you just use the same formats and concatenate it to get to visualize them. And then save and reuse. Either you can save these model, share it with your colleague. They can read the model and just predict whatever they wanted to predict for the data that they have. So they need not redo the modeling what we have done here. They just can save the, the load the model which you have saved or save the workflow, reuse for a different data set. All these things can be done within the platform. So now looking at 95.0, this is much more interactive, intuitive, and with a modern UI. So Android, when you're using back in like 2011 or six, you could see how the Android icons look like. And then back later in 2015, 14, they also called as something modern UI, 
So something that tremendous change you can see in NIMES, Node, UI, especially visualization, which is, which is one of my favorite, where you can have much more interactive UI. That's where we call it as Power BI, Tableau, Fusion from Oracle. This is all for visualization. This is where business analytics, data analytics, all data engineers and ETLs, there are a lot of job opportunities out there. So you need to visualize your data. Even we also visualize a lot of our clinical data too. It's very important for us when we are trying to convey or communicate how this reacts with the disease or different cancer. So here, the UI is being much more improved to ease of use. You can see that it's more interactive. These are some of the chemical structures which I've taken from NIME website. Uh, so it's, it's whatever the data I'm showing, it's all from the NIME uh, presentations or from the website. So you can, it's, it's publicly available. So new spreadsheet manipulation and automation nodes. Automation is the key here. So even though we call it as a workflow management platform, but we want to automate them. You can automate bit depending upon the time and schedule them, but not on your laptop. It should be on the cloud to schedule them. Uh, so it's a nine hub. But otherwise, you can time dependent. You can say intervals at what interval it has to run. All those things can be configured properly here. And today, what we are going to do is uh, the nine AI extension with the chatbot. We are going to do, I'll be showing you a small example with the nine AI assistant using chat GPT. And it has its own extension within nine. Uh, for beginners, it's really useful. So it also enhancements to Python extension, SkyKid learning integration. So how many of you work on Python coding here? Oh, great, nice. So uh, even though I said no coding, within nine, you have a node which says Python script up. So you can put the exact Python scripts to your nine node, where you can script the same syntax you follow. The benefit here is whatever the variables you're using, let's say I'm reading a variable, an uh, Excel file from a node and putting it to the Python script up, that is a variable now. This variable can be easily defined within your script, which is in, within the nine, vice versa. All these things can be integrated seamlessly and very easily within nine. So it's both ways doable. And then additional visualization capabilities. Plotly is one of my favorite. So Plotly also works if someone have worked already on Plotly and few of the nine, uh, uh, nine zone visualizations are there and few other partner extensions to that. And nine reporting labs and integrated cloud platforms, which I already just mentioned about it. About it. So now the key features of nine is something very important to look at is that Application tab. This is like your Chrome tab, like, right? Control T or con sorry, Control N. It opens a new workspace for you. So this is the work. This is the workspace that you wanted to work on. So Control N goes to a new workspace, and you can save it by clicking the button here. So on the side panel, there are a few of the things that you have to look at. There are something like to node the description, node repository, and Space Explorer. It's very very important when you're working on with a node please go through the description. Uh, we will be, because we want to do something quickly, right? We never read the description. We just go load the stuff and then worry, okay, if it's, there's error, we go back to the description. So try to understand what kind of input and output that we can expect there. It's very, very important when you are trying to do that. And then the workflow editor, you can configure, run, delete, rename, however you want to connect, all those things can be done on the editor. You can annotate them. I'll give you an example for the annotation and then uh, node monitor. So basically you can see whether the node ran, it gave some output, so all the outputs can be displayed at the bottom. I know it's not so clear here, but I'll show you the software quickly. <laughs> and some of that uh, other things is like uh, the workflow toolbar and node repository results, uh, which can have a lot of nodes in it. You can install nodes from the partner libraries, which some are free, uh, most of them are free, some are paid and licensed, uh, but for most of our use, it's mostly free. So we need to pay for it. And then rename them and node action bars and et cetera. So this was one of the question like, how do we deploy them to the cloud? Basically you will be doing all the workflows and uh, you will be doing everything on your laptop, on your normal offline nine uh, analytics platform. And the, within the nine platform, you have an option to connect it to the cloud, either to your community hub, which is publicly accessible, or through the nine hub or business hub, which is privately within your network or within your uh, ecosystem. And then this can be versioned in order to deploy within the hub because hub again acts as a cloud like AWS. It has its own CPU and RAM where it can run 
those workflows within the cloud. You need not to have your laptop to run in these workflows. Or to share, you can use again, use the hub so that colleagues can download it and then load it into their NIME and then use it. And then you can manage access if someone wants to be restricted from certain projects or other. So now today uh, we will be looking at the chat GPT. So you need to have the certain uh, API access and also any codes that is required or provided by OpenAI, Hugging Face, Hub, Chat GPT for all, they all give the API. So that can be implemented or integrated into Nine. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this uh, building and querying the vector stores chroma. Uh, uh, it's something really uh, good. We have some applications on uh, proteomics, protein structures also using chroma, and then files as well as nodes for combining multiple vector stores and LLMs into the agents. You can find these all in extensions in hub.mine.com. Some of the data visualization nodes, as I already told you, there are some JavaScript based visualizers, then, uh, uh, then Plotly is there, which I told you something more interactive, and then something uh, scripting that can be from Python also, Python viewers are there. And some of the, uh, what to say, area specific visualizers are also available from the partner extensions respectively. And these integrations, as I said, Python is integrated, R is integrated. Uh, anyone heard about Weka? W-E-K-A, Weka, oh, nice, thanks. So a pretty old uh, statistical and machine learning package uh, before all this Python getting moved up. So uh, Weka is also well integrated here. And uh, Nine has its own AutoML uh, nodes for regression as well as for classification. We have from H2O AutoML, which is completely using ML-based algorithms for training your data. JavaScript, you can also integrate with AWS, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, everything. These are some of the sample of plots that's being generated from Nine. And we will quickly go to uh, a Nine demo. So I have another 12 minutes to go, so uh, hopefully I can finish it soon. Okay, so this is how uh, the nine interface looks like. This is the home, exactly what I told you. It's a tab like you see in the Chrome tab, right? So this is the home you come. I always recommend you to start with these examples to play around how it works, right? And then get on to play around with something new. But let me show you something more interesting to you because today's uh, title itself is Learnathon, Chatbot, AI. So let's play around something with AI. So, so uh, the shortcut that I told you was Control N to create a new workspace or workflow. Now I'm giving N to you demo one and then create it. So it will create a new workspace or workflow. I don't know why, since I'm sharing the screen, it's not allowing me to do it. Okay, let me try it. Okay, I don't know. Uh, being I'm sharing the screen, it's not allowing. I already have a backup plan, so no worries. <laughs> so, so you have to install something called as Nine AI extensions. Now I'll quickly show you how to install them. After going to this home button, you have to click on this I information icon, and there you have something called as install extensions at the bottom. You need internet for this. So click on install extensions based on your internet speed and others. It might take some time to load. Yeah, it loaded. And uh, when you scroll down, there'll be something called as nine extensions within the bracket lab. So here it is nine lab extensions, that's the best way. So nine lab extensions will be there. So you have to install Sorry. Yeah. So 
since I have already installed, so let me let me enable this. So for you, it will show up. Since I've already installed it, it won't be showing it, but I'm, I've disabled this hide items that are already installed, so it should show up now. So, yes. Yeah, so one is NIME reporting latch that to be installed. And the other one is NIME AI assistant latch. Right? These two to be installed for the demo that I'm going to show you quickly. So once you click on them, for example, like this, you have to click and then you have to click on next. Some agreements, agree, do not agree. Most of you have to agree and then continue and finish it off. So it will install. So any extensions you install in order to get it implemented into the nine, you have to restart it. So it will ask for restart, just restart it. It quickly comes out. And then you can close this. So we are back to nine. I have already installed that. So I'm not restarting. If you are installing it, please restart it. So now I have an interface. I'm trying to uh, create on this one. Yeah. So uh, when you restart, you will see something like this, the chat icons like this on your left-hand side bar. And there's a disclaimer. Please close that and make sure you log in. So you have to create an account in order to use this, right? So I, I cannot, I have already logged in, so it should be okay for me, but make sure uh, in your case, you have to create an account and log in. But anyway, that's a different process. So I'm, I'm not going to try that now if it is taking too much time. What I'm going to show you is I have already created something. Here in the AI assistant, I asked to generate Please generate a workflow, right? Workflow to read an Excel file and filter the row to be displayed in a box chart. I mean, yeah, that's what, bar chart, not box, bar chart. That's all I wrote it as, like you write it in chat GPT, right? And they created this particular workflow, right? So you need to log in and you need to have that extensions to be installed. So just for beginners, it's really good. But for an advanced user, now I won't be directly going to this because I don't want the internet to understand what I'm looking for. <laughs> That's the main reason. So this does that. But before doing that, in order to build the workflow, on the top you can see Q&A and, and build. Make sure you click on this build. Otherwise, it will not build the uh, workflow because if it is on Q&A, it will just tell you what are the nodes that can be used. So it will suggest the nodes and you have to do build the workflow by yourself. So if you're by just giving the typing there, if you're, if you're still on q &A, it won't generate the workflow. It will just suggest the notes. So make sure you click on the build mode. It will automatically write the workflow for you. Okay. So for just for starting, it will be really helpful for you. Right. Now, how do we all chat GPT is really uh, interesting. <laughs> makes us a bit lazy, but let's try to do something more sensible. Now, I created a new workspace now. I'm not going to use AI learner here. I'm going to do it manually. Now, this is where the repository. So here, what you see is the node description. This is the repository. This is where you will see the local space where you can see all the workflows you have saved and loaded, even from your Nine Hub or Community Hub. And this is the AI assistant. So let me go with this repository. Now you can search the notes. I, I don't say all keywords will be there, but most of them are there. Let me see if I want to find a duplicate. Oh yeah, it's there. Duplicate row, if I want to find a duplicate row. I want to read a CSV file, CSV. I have both reader and writer. So I'm just uh, clicking on them and dragging it to my workspace. And that's there. Now there are two ways to have other nodes added or continue to this node. One is you can click on this output arrow, drag it, and you can see there's a plus symbol there. Like there is a plus symbol. I know it's a bit light on the screen, but yeah, it's there. If you click on that plus or mouse over on the plus and you can search over there, I wanted to column filter and I can do it there itself, right? It's there, column filter. I just click on them, it's there. 
The other way to do is, I want to write it as an Excel file. I, I read it as a CSV file. I want to write it as an Excel file. I just dragged and dropped it here. Now I need to connect it. So I can drag, uh, my use my cursor there, and then uh, click on it and drag it to connect it, right? Multiple outputs cannot be connected to a single input, no one. But multiple outputs can go to multiple nodes. So let me clear that. So if I'm, if I'm trying to write a CSV, and then a table, so I can have this all to, so the output can be dragged to multiple nodes for multiple tasks that you want to perform, right, as a single click. But then if I want to have, uh, for example, I want to have table cropper, table creator, I want all this to go to this particular input, yeah. It will accept only one. So one input will accept only one input, but I can add more if I really wanted to. So if I click plus there, I, I can add more. So some of the nodes accepted, I can go and keep on adding multiple inputs. Some nodes doesn't. So it depends upon the nature of the node that you're handling, or you need to have multiple nodes to handle the multiple outputs. So keep that in mind. And there are something called as flow variables. Uh, which is a bit more advanced. I want to, uh, I'm not going to cover that today, but it will be useful mainly for Python scripters. And if you want to have multiple tables that to be used as a data for the next uh, uh, node, this is where the uh, flow variable. So you can take the variable from this node and feed into some other node. It's not the, actually the output file. It is just taking the variable from your node and putting it to the next node. It's sharing the variables, right? If you're customizing the variables or something like that. Any questions so far before I continue or before I run this? Finding it difficult? Okay, nobody said yes, so that means it is easy. That's good. <laughs> when, when is the first time you found nine? Like, as a curiosity, right? Like, it was several years ago that you met nine. Yeah. Like the first time. Can, can you recall or? 2007. So 2007, that's where that time we don't have this RD kit and all that time it was CDK. Uh -huh. uh, that was mainly one. And mostly others where they, we didn't have Excel read at that time. It's mostly CSV. Okay. So mostly data manipulation, but there was a reason because one of uh, the software that I was handling, I don't want to say the name here. So that was having nine nodes. Okay. So that was one of the reasons that software actually introduced okay. me tonight. It was an integration. It was an integration. Yeah. All right, just uh, a new really important information about the event and AI and nine. I ordered the pizza, so it's on its <laughs> 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 So yeah. A any questions on the notes, installing extensions, workflows? The chatbot within the nine. I'm not, I'm not sure it's really well, but I tried installing extensions and uh -huh. nine and came up with a box set installing. And um, well, that just went on and off. Um, and that's not really installed. On your left hand bottom corner, you will see some updates there. Um, I don't know, is that the box? It's installing. Oh, maybe internet is slow. Could be. Yeah. Found a typo in one of the nodes. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so if you go to Excel Reader uh -huh. and click on a variable import, it is import instead of import. Ah, <laughs> it's for Polo <laughs> to fix them. Yeah, the users. <laughs> Great. So one one more uh, tip is that it will be so tempting to install all the extensions out there. Please do not do that. It will take up a lot of your hard disk space. So try to start with small. Yeah. And, and as, soon, as soon as you expand your uh, ecosystem that you want to do more things, slowly install each of these extensions. Otherwise, it will eat up a lot of your hard disk space. Is there like an online forum where we can ask like questions? Community forum, yeah. hub.line.com. It, it's, it's very active.
All right? Okay, let's run the first flow. I'm going to run a very simple flow, uh, which was generated by the AI chatbot. So I have already preloaded the data inside. So just to show you, I have a data about athletic, Olympic athletic, about um, when they were born, the name, gender, um, the day of birth or date of birth, and from which country they are from. So if I want to do some analysis on this data, this is a sample data which is already there in the nine, you will be able to access the same data from your sample examples, the basic examples. So when I load them, there are certain things that you have to look at this particular node. We need to define which column, which row to be defined as a title for the column. For example, here, the row one defines the column name, like athletic identification, full name, gender. So you have to define, you can define it here. Use values in row as a column name, one or two. Sometimes if it is not well ordered or well formatted Excel sheets or CSV files, we don't find them on the top, might be in the second or maybe later. So we have to define them. Or if you want to limit the number of rows for reading, we can limit that. But the best part here is, if you're where you want to read from, this is very important. If you're mentioning it to local file system, it will go to your, this PC, C drive, my documents, download, desktop, wherever you want to access. But there is something called mount point, relative to and custom. Relative to means, Let's say you wanted to share this workflow with someone else. If I put it as a local system, since my name is Giri, my machine also will be having a username like Giri. Giri documents, then let's say um, text.csv file. When I'm sharing this workflow with another person, they will also have the same path, Giri, my documents, and then text.csv. But their name might be different there. The path will be different. So if you want to share something, with the local file system, it will not work. If they know how to fix it, it's all good. Otherwise, if the best way is to do it to relative to, so that is called relative to, and then say current workflow. So when you save your workflow, it can save it as a data within the workflow. Mm -hmm. And when you share the workflow, the data also goes along with it, if it is a shareable data. So those things you have to take. So from where you're reading your data, it can be from internet, it can be from SharePoint, it can be from your local machine, or it can be within the workflow space. So we define a folder when you open the line. So this is something very important that you have to look at. And then let me quickly run this. I can run one by one if I wanted to, or I can run the final one. But this is, I have already run them, so I can click reset to put it back so I am not executing them. So let me click on this and run them. In order to run the bar plot, I need to read the data. So automatically nine knows that where should it come from since I have connected them. So I click this run, so it reads, it goes to raw filter and then I get the bar chart. Now in the raw filter, what I have given is, I told, okay, now it shows MTF since I did not define it well, which country basically. I gave CAN, C-A-N, that's what is there. Now, how do I know it is CAN or USA or how do I know which data is? So you can actually view the data by just clicking on the Excel reader. If it is green color, if it is RAN, at the bottom, you can view the output, right, instantly. Or most of the time, you can click the right button and you will be able to, there'll be, there'll be options here to view the data. But here, by default, you can view them at the bottom. You can scroll, you can sort, all things can be done here. So I know it is here, this is where the country is, can FRA, different three letter codes being given for different countries. Now, I want to know how many of them are there from Canada. So I can visualize this, open view, and this is interactive, 72 from Canada. Very simple analysis, not high rocket, rocket science or anything like that. So very simple to show you how it works. But you can also download this uh, chart. So if I say open view, and you can download it here, save the image, right? So this is a simple run. Please uh, try to do it yourself, a very simple one. Uh, just reading, uh, analyzing, and then 
uh, moving forward with visualization or writing it as a file. So that's all from me for today, but I'll be around here to help you around. So before I end up, I would like to thank my colleagues, Colin Lewis, Bodan, Milosh, and Abarna, and my friends at uh, Signature being very supportive because Nine doesn't work with a single person because it's a collaborative project for multiple things, multiple expertise required sometimes, but not always, on a higher level uh, <laughs> stuff. And the team at uh, uh, Nine, uh, and uh, Dr. Daphne at NQ and Paul and Rosaria uh, at Nine for their invitation. Thank you so much for your patience. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right. So thank you for being here. So a bit about me before we start. So you you know who you're the presenter as well. So I'm uh, Paolo Tamignini. I'm a senior data scientist at Nine. Uh, I work in Berlin. This morning I woke up in Berlin and somehow I'm here today. <laughs> really cool. Um, and yeah, so I'm a data scientist and I'm in the evangelism team. Um, it's this uh, a team that is uh, creating all this content uh, and courses and uh, online books and all this uh, information that you can find about Nine to learn it and also to uh, meet the community, right? What we are doing today, there is some people that already know Nine and want to meet. So, is the evangelism team, webinars, and so on. And today, um, I'm here to, to conduct this new format of event, which is called the Nine AI Learnathon. It's the second time we're running this. Last week, we ran this already in Hamburg, and people were quite happy. Maybe we can collect feedback about this later. And um, what is the this uh, Nine AI Learnathon? It's basically notes, again. Nine often is about notes, right? Notes that let you uh, query those large language models that you can call for short AI, right? That you can call, and some of those models you can call there locally, some of them are the popular ones, like uh, OpenAI. A few weekends back, everyone was hearing about what was going on with OpenAI and these GPT models and the CEO, right? Like the results of drama lately, right? But this is a big topic, right? So these nodes, you can combine them in workflow and build your own chatbot on your own knowledge base. And for example, uh, then you can upload it on the cloud, deploy, and then someone can use your workflow in this shape. You see, it's, it's a UI, and you can maybe upload a document, and then you can make a really hard question to your AI, yeah, like uh, what happened here exactly, and this really precise term. The AI reads your document and answers your question, right? So this is really handy. It's a new way to work with these large language models. And today we're gonna get a taste of it. Of course, we're not gonna train today a large language models because these models are really big, billions of parameters, takes a really long time, lots of money, computational resources. Today we're gonna learn something new. All right, so let's get started. So LLMs are really smart, but they do not know everything. That's the point, right? So I was using here GP3, GPT 3.5, so it's already a bit updated. You can try the same with GPT 4. You ask, who is today uh, the president of the, the United States, right? And it says, oh, you know, like last time I was trained in September 2021, so I don't know right now what's, what's happening, right? Like if you ask GPT 4, it's going to say something like April 2023, right? So what does that mean? The model was created, and then it knows just what was available back then, right? So if you want to ask things, or you don't want to give context, or the user doesn't want to give context, they struggle with it. Okay, let's make a really more important question here. What is the nine AI learner? It doesn't know. AI, the no default AI doesn't know what uh, up to September 2021, it didn't exist the AI learner. So the AI doesn't know about this really special event they're running today. Like, wow, right? So just to show you quickly, I basically, and you can also do it later if you want. I have credentials for everybody. I'm going now on this education app. So this is a private um, installations of this name. This is app where I deployed my workshop. And uh, I, I can put here my credentials. Uh, for example, these, uh, they all have names of animals, but uh, I, have, I have here, um, uh, I can also distribute them later, right? So you can try it yourself. And I log in, this is the this private business app that was mentioned before by Diana. I can go here in the team that we're going to use today, the iLearnathon team. 
and I can go here into the deployments, right? And the deployments means that those work those workflows are now deployed as data. And so I can go here and run one of those deployments. And you see that now it's loading all these nodes, execute, they, they, are, they are creating for me a way to access an AI where we can ask about the AI learning. In fact, it says, I'm Paolo AI, I'm Paolo. It's my AI, an AI assistant designed to help you with AI learning, right? So I customized it for my own need. So what can I ask, for example? Um, what can, who, who is Paolo, right? I can ask something like that. Who is Paolo, right? And this AI is customized to answer, Paolo is the person in front of you, right? Like, of course, I, I instructed to be smart as like this, right? Something else that we can ask. Um, let me see, like, what can you tell me? Tell me more about this event, right? I, I don't even want to say that I learned. So tell me more about uh, this event. So then it goes and see the data I provided it with, and it's going to tell me the I learned the event is an exam session where participants can learn how to build their own AI powered chatbot, like, you know, the stuff that you found in the description of the event. What else can we ask? Uh, where is happening? And then here it answers in the Nottingham Trent University in Nottingham UK. So it is, is really knowledgeable, right? Like, um, and, and, and I could go on for it, right? Like, how did I do this? I didn't train my own AI to answer this question. Yeah, GPT doesn't know it. We are using GPT here, by the way, right? This open AI model. Yeah, it knows, but the main one doesn't know. So how is it possible, right? So today we're gonna learn how this is possible. And let me pull back on the slides. Okay. So there are four ways to customize a large language models that doesn't require not even fine tuning it, not even partially retraining this really large neural network. This is prompt engineering, hyperparameter tuning, retrieval augmented generation, and conversational retrieval strategies. All of this is coming with this blog post. All the links are available um, are available at the link I gave you. So you can then maybe in the coming weeks read a bit more at your own pace. But let's go quickly on what it is, this stuff. Prompt engineering. You see here a string manipulation node because now is always about nodes. What are we doing here? We're taking uh, the input, giving some context to the eye. This is your role, right? And then we say, okay, so uh, please answer in the following way. And then we paste the question of the user, right? And then we say, answer the question using this text, right? So what is prompt engineering? It sounds like a really fancy thing. We're just gluing together strings, right? <coughs> the user doesn't see it, but that's what's happening in the end, okay? And of course, a string manipulation can help us to glue together this information to give more information to the, to the AI when we ask things. Next, there are a few parameters that you, you can play with. If you're beginning, you can also leave them as default. So don't be too worried. One is, of course, in this case, this is the OpenAI model connector. So you can pick which OpenAI model you want. And each model comes with a context window and you can check online, but basically this is how, how much text can it go through, right? With your context, the question of the user, the answer, how much context. And that's why you have, for example, GP3.5 16K. This is a measure of tokens. So it doesn't count the words, it counts these tokens with this, this unique measure of the model to measure the text, okay? Each model has a different way to measure it. And then you can simply, uh, select here, for example, how big can be the response of the user, right? Like if you take all the uh, input of the model plus the output, you can leave it. Temperature, this is a bit more fun. How, how much the model can take risk to answer your question, right? You want it to be boring, so you lower the temperature. You want it to take more risk and be more creative and come up with something crazy, you can raise this temperature, right? And so you can play a bit with those parameters. And here it comes, the, 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 the really interesting part, right? Retrieval augmented generation. We have some text data. 
this text data as the answer that the model seeks, and we can provide it to the model to answer. All right. So let's go a bit more in detail in this diagram here. What we do. So this is all your company knowledge base. I mean, you can decide how, how much is the, the stuff you have. So maybe it's emails, right? Maybe it's all these uh, documents that you're collecting. And all of this stuff is all text that you have in your organization. Then you take all this text and you can transform it in a format that the model understands, okay? And this is called an embedding. It's a semantic representation of this text. And you can put it in a vector store. Okay, so those are just numbers. It's a bit scary and so on. But what it actually is, it's a space, you know, like, you know, the space you have in a graph, which are semantic. So cat, a kitten would go in the closed space of this multidimensional space, right? And cat and dog too, but dog would be closer to, I don't know, breed of dogs. And we can represent all this data using this vector store. And then here it is, the description of the event of today. I can also transform that description of the event in this numerical format, right? That's now what I did there, right? And then you can simply see the, you see the, the user is asking, what is the I learner, right? And also the question of the user can be transformed in a number, right? And so when we are going to answer, the, the model can really fast by looking at this number representation of the question of the document to find really fast the document where it needs to read to answer the question, right? So even if you have many, many documents in this vector store, you can quickly get the document that it needs to be able to answer the question and also to be smart about it, right? <laughs> So this is the something they were going to learn today. And it's actually the key to lots of this uh, customization of there. And then it comes the other part. So conversational retrieval agents. So this is about the ability of the large language model to chat and to also automatically take questions by your own design. So this is a bit interesting. So you see here a diagram that shows how the AI is deciding what to do before replying to the user, right? So that means that it's not a single call of the model. So you know, you just have an input and you receive an output. There is an assistant can be engineered to kind of have the model ask itself what to do before answering you, right? So for example, it could be, okay, let's take the question of the user and then ask the AI first to remove anything that is not relevant to the real question. Please AI, right, do this. Don't answer yet. Do this first step, right? And this is something that is happening a lot with those agents, which are also able to decide when to use this vector store or not, right? So let's see an example. What is the AI learner can ask the user? The AI could answer, I don't know, bye, but it could go, how can I find input information on this topic? And I could say, I could search this document with the event description. And then it's keep on, you know, triggering itself until it knows what, like something that is happening, right? So what should I search in this document? I could search for the sentence describing the I learned. Okay, the I learned is this because I found it in the document, right? So it's not just one execution of the model. It feels like one when I showed you before but it's not just one, it's more than one. Okay, so this is something that you can do with nodes and we have the agent node, for example. So some stuff is automated for you, right? Automatically you say, this is the vector store, this is the question of the user and uh, please answer, right? And it does automatically for you. Some other stuff you could even engineer yourself step-by-step, step, right? Because now as all these nodes, you can customize a lot. Okay. To be honest, we cannot cover everything today, right? So I highly recommend this webinar from our product team, the developers behind those notes made this beautiful webinar. It's in the slides, watch it to learn more, highly recommend. Okay, so a little recap of what we, we covered today. It was just to, to get back together. First, you can create custom AI around these large language models. You can customize things. And there are ways to do it. 
Two. This is useful when the large language model doesn't know on its own. If you ask something that, you know, like is the earth, is the earth flat? You know, it's gonna be awfully, right? GPT knows this kind of stuff. But if you have something it doesn't know, you can use vector store and provide answers this way. Three, you can do all of this without coding using nine nodes. <laughs> That's the, the fun part. And four, something I didn't cover yet. Oh, yeah, four, you can customize a lot this process about you know having the AI think on its own and find the thing. But really interesting, the core framework we're working on is not for one AI only, right? GPT-4, for example, or open AI in general. There are other large language models that are being created out there. We don't know what the future is. Everything is happening really fast right now, right? So for example, I highly recommend these GPT for all models. What are those? Open source models. You can download them, use them, and then it's all local. And yes, right now they are not as good as performance as GPT-4, but we're building a framework that you can use the model you want, or maybe even more than one model, right? Using all these models that are being shared out. Some of which are open source, some of which you need to send the data through an API. Okay. All right, so possible use cases on why this is, could be useful. Legal experts chat, chat, right? You have all these court cases, maybe those are even public, and you make really smart question about what to do about this court case, right? The AI reads inside all these documents and says, well, actually, these already happened before, right? And this could be used, of course, some testing, but we are heading towards that direction. Okay, this is maybe less exciting, but we are going to maybe sometimes your internet doesn't work at home. You need to connect to your provider and tell what's up, and you need to wait for the human to answer you. You have your phone that is right. So all of this is already done, and it will be improved a lot by this easy way to customize AIs, right? So custom uh, care, customer care, custom chatbot, right? To answer about any company problem with your customer. Okay, this is a bit scary, but maybe a doctor wants to, you know, have uh, an AI to reason with to understand what is the right diagnos diagnosis for a patient, right? So there are all these patient records that are overwhelming for the doctor to read all. And you, you can maybe have a chatbot that is expert in healthcare data and the patient data. And then one that is uh, interesting because it's also uh, uh, what we're going to do today. So a chatbot that is expert on a machine, a machine with all its complexity, its components, right? All the, how it works, how you maintain it, how you deassemble it, how you put it back together, right? We're gonna use an AI that is expert on one machine, right? That is, can be useful itself. So this is what we're going to do. And the machine is a copy machine, <laughs> so nothing to come, right? So I downloaded this public copy machine uh, manual book, which has lots of text because it's like, to be honest, it's not that every Italian has one of those. It would be really complex to have, right? But outside of Italy, it's hard to find the best espresso. So people buy those a lot, right? And, and there are so many buttons and customization of this copy machine, right? So today we're going to see how you can use an AI that you can ask question about this copy machine. It reads in this really big manual book and then answer. So for example, you can ask, what is the media to control question? The pizza, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and then the AI answer by reading exactly what it says here, right? So 60, 65 degrees and it gets it, uh, Somewhere here, you see 60, 65 degrees. It, it finds the information from this matter. Okay, so it's gonna be a big exercise, all right? I don't expect you to do everything today, right? But it's gonna go from easy to more and more advanced. And then you can take also at home, at your own pace, how far you want to go, okay? So the first step is to create a knowledge base to basically convert this coffee machine manual book in a vector store. B is to use a large language models for a simple, you know, answering a list of questions. There is no user interface. There is no user on the web. It's just, you know, like 
the AI going question after question and answering them. Okay. And then we can also build the, the this UI here and deploying it. And then optionally for the if you want to also deploy it to see how it looks on your web browser, not within your nine, you can also connect to the nine business app and then deploy it. All right, so for the first part, you see it's this is the, the beginning, right? It's fundamental, it's pretty easy. You need to uh, put your credentials here, and I'm going to share credentials with you so you don't need to set up any OpenAI account. Then you need to connect to OpenAI, select the embeddings model that creates these vectors, and then load the PDF divided by sentences, and for each sentence, create a vector. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six nodes. Then you write to disk your vectors. Right? So this is going to be the vector store that you're going to use later. For number B, you load back your vector store via model reader node. And then you can use the vector store retriever node to say, find me the sentence that answered the question about the coffee machine. And then you're going to combine it together with the question of the user and then ask the AI. This, this is the question of the user. This is the, the sentence that we found that has possibly the answer, right? And then you can write in an Excel file the answers. By the way, I stored the question is, I also stored the answer. So you can see whether the AI is actually right about what it's saying or not, okay? Unless you're a coffee machine expert, I don't know. All right, and then finally, there is the builder chat data. So this is about using this agent node that does a bit more than just one shot calling, right? It's basically using the vector store when it, it decides to use it. And this is about creating a component and inside the component, you can add this agent node. This becomes more advanced. And this is how it looks like, like the one I showed you before, right? Who are you? I'm a chatbot. By the way, you can also play with the solution today. Huh? You don't need to build everything. You can also just open the solution and play with it. And finally, we have the deployment that you connect your analytics platform to this uh, business app I was using, and then you can deploy it. And then you can run it, and, and it looks like it's in your web browser, right? Okay, so they online, we still have 46 people online. I'm sorry that you're not here with us. So to have pizza, I also ordered some beers. So they're going to ask the ID to the professor in the UK when you order beer, I think, right? They always ask for that. Okay, but some people from the online stream are going to uh, please stay with us if you want to see the next instructions, but we are going to cover this exercise. If you haven't downloaded them that yet, you can simply go on abdonine.com and look for the AI learner and find those exercises because they are already public for anyone to find on the internet. And uh, when you find them, you can find a folder and you can indivi download individually. The exercise is the one where you can work. The solution is like if you, I mean, it's, it's the solved uh, with all the dots. The PDF is the, the information that you want to use with the coffee machine. And here it is, basically you download it. If you download it, all the files together, it's gonna look like this. Wait a second here because I need to, you cannot see the reset. I cannot. Uh, anyway, if you go at that tiny URL, AI, learn AI nothing, and you will find this file here, which has everything, right? K N A R. Yeah. And um, and yeah. So then you can then open your local space and import it. To import it, you simply need to use import workflow button and then select it and it's going to load it. All right, so you can also find those slides to, to cover at your own pace and also be here. But basically this is how it looks like when you open it and you have the exercise and the solution and the PDF. And, um, and also really important. Okay, so this is really important. Uh, I'm going to distribute now credentials to this instance here. Why do we need credentials? Because we found out in the last event that we cannot all use the same key to access the art, right? So I deploy a data, right? 
Can you can you help me to distribute yeah. those in the next slide? All right. So what second? Yes, we have time. Okay. So here. All right. So here there are those credentials, and in the credentials is going to read like a name of an animal dash a number. Okay. When you use it, you simply need to go on edu. I mean, I need to now log out, right? So what is it? Um, so when you log in, it's going to look like this. You go to adu-app.9.com. I can give this to you. And, and when you log in, the password is always hub, H-U-B, all right? And why do we do this? Because when you access, then you can, I can I'll show you how to find the, the credentials. So for example, I'll do canid1, please don't use my password now that you know it. And when we go here, once we go here, you need to go in your team, right? You need to select, your, you see up here, you need to select your team, okay? Really important, select your team. Did it work? HUB, yeah, yeah, HUB the password, all right, HUB. Okay, when you select it, then you can go to deployment, okay? And then here you can run the, uh, this app. I will now close for the, for the online ones. Thank you so much for staying with us.